Thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at nuclear energy. These slides will help you understand how nuclear energy works, risks, and safety measures of nuclear engineering, uh, nuclear energy. So first of all, let's recognize that France is the country that relies on nuclear power the most. 78% of their power comes from it. How does it work? Try this. Order the following stages of heat transfer in a nuclear power plant. Go ahead and hit pause. All right, welcome back. Let's check how you did. Two, one, five, four, three. Let's take a look at this in the diagram. So the heat starts here from the nuclear reaction of uranium atom splitting. That heat heats the water that's in the primary loop. And this water stays as hot water. It transfers, it goes into this heat transfer where the heat is given to the secondary loop of water. And when this heat um, goes into the water, it turns it to steam. So now we have steam going through a turbine, turns the blades, turns the generator, makes electricity. That steam goes to the condenser where it's cooled to become water again. And that happens from the cooling loop. So the water that's been cooled now goes back to the heat transfer where it picks up heat again, turns into steam, and the cycle repeats. So in the condenser, the cooling loop uh, picks up heat and then carries it to the cooling tower where that heat is dissipated into the environment. From there, the water um, is either just boiled off, vaporized, or it can be returned to the, um, uh, or it can be returned to the local water from where it was taken. So usually these cooling towers, they have to be next to some water source, a lake, a river, or an ocean. All right, so how does this fission process work? We have one neutron that comes in, hits a uranium atom, causing that atom to split. And in this case, it's making krypton and barium. It also releases three new neutrons, which can then go off and split more uranium atoms. So it happens that it forms a fission chain reaction. So here you can see that each, uh, each one of these neutrons goes off and hits another uh, uranium atom, splitting it, releasing three more neutrons, and so forth. And here you can see the reaction chamber, the core. It's water, and you lower fuel rods into it, and those fuel rods contain the uranium. But very importantly, you also have control rods that are made of graphite, which is carbon and those rods can absorb neutrons to slow down or even stop the nuclear chain reaction. Here's a summary of some, some environmental impacts of coal versus nuclear, and I wanna point out some of them. The big thing is that coal has considerable emissions of greenhouse gases, whereas nuclear has none because it does not emit any CO2, at least not during plant operation. There is some from when the fuel is, or a significant amount from when the fuel is being uh, mined, the uranium is being mined and processed and transported. Other pollutants, you see all these ones here, that can be part of industrial smog. Uh, we don't get that at all with nuclear because the only thing that comes off of nuclear is H2O vapor. And that's what comes out of the cooling towers. Solid waste, coal produces solid waste. Um, you have leftover ash from the burning of the coal. Not in nuclear, much less is produced. And um, as far as ecosystem disturbance from mining, it's pretty extensive for coal, less extensive for nuclear, but definitely there is environmental impacts of mining for uranium. And as far as how long it'll last, we don't know, really. It could be lasting a couple hundred years, or we might learn how to use more types of different nuclear materials. Okay, let's take a look at the greenhouse gas emissions. This is a summary we can see here, obviously coal is the worst, then oil and natural gas, all of our fossil fuels are the worst. Nuclear is quite low down here. Uh, even solar has some impact from the generation of the solar panels. Nuclear accidents, this is, this is a big deal. Um, basically, we can have um, yeah, nuclear trouble, let's start with that. It's clean, but it does have the issue of mining and refining uranium, which takes a lot of energy and has all the problems associated with mining, destruction of habitat, erosion, acid drainage, etc. the danger of going into mines. And the consequence of accidents can be catastrophic, such as a Chernobyl meltdown in 1986 in the former Soviet Union, or Fukushima more recently in 2011. And its waste is dangerously radioactive for thousands of years. But nonetheless, 
Over 400 nuclear power plants remain operating today. All right, uranium mine. Here's a, an example in Nambia, Nambia uh, in Africa. Open pit formed with dynamite. So from that rock, from that ore, uh, they can melt it and extract the pure uranium. There was one accident you should be aware of in 1979. This is the only nuclear power reactor problem we've had in the U.S. And uh, what happened is there was a partial meltdown. It was the worst in U.S. history, but epidemiological studies show no resulting cancer. So as they followed people who were exposed, they didn't see any effects. Chernobyl was a huge one, definitely the world's biggest before Fukushima came around. And uh, you can see um, here, this is the concrete containment building, also called the sar sarcophagus, and uh, it exploded basically. So all the material inside were um, scattered from the nuclear core and the region is still hot. No one can live there. The fallout was spread all over Europe. It's pretty intense. We'll probably watch a cool video about it that Nova did a while back. Health effects, this is the big thing. Thyroid cancer. Had a huge spike in the 90s in Belarus, which is the area where um, Chernobyl is. And here's Fukushima, Japan. We watched the video in class. But just want to point out that these radioactive elements are finding their way into the seawater where they can bioaccumulate and biomagnify through the oceanic food chains. And also the radioactive fallout from this explosion can deposit on nearby food crops. Let's take a look at nuclear waste. Which of the following are approaches to dealing with radioactive spent nuclear fuel? This is a multiple mark. So go ahead and pause. All right, so it's the first two. We let the fuel, which is solid, sit in pools of water for several years to become less radioactive. Then we take them out of the water and we store them in dry containers called casks. And that usually happens at the power plant facility. So here we see a picture of that wet storage. And here we see a picture of these casks for the dry storage. Where these casks are stored is usually right on site. All these dots here are nuclear power plants. And we can see ours right here in San Luis Obispo. There was an idea um, to have the storage of nuclear waste in Nevada in a buried network of tunnels. And here, the tunnel has been built. You can see people going into it to work on it. And this is the diagram of what the idea is. You bring in the materials by train you take them down through this tunnel and you bury them deep in the ground. Um, however, because nobody really, well, the state of Nevada was not in favor of it. It was more like the federal government pushing it. And so eventually they just stopped funding it and the, the um, project stopped. Here's another question for you about half-life. One of the byproducts of uranium fission is cesium-135, having a half-life of 2.3 million years. If you start with 20 kilograms of the material, how much will still be radioactive after 9.2 million years? Okay, so what's the approach for this? We should recognize that 2.3 goes into 9.2 four times. And because of that, if you start with 20 kilograms, you're going to do um, 20 divided by 4, sorry, 20 divided by 2 four times. So you go from 20 to 10, 10 to 5. 5 to 2.5, and 2.5 to 1.25. So that's the answer. This is the idea of radioactive half-life. So if you start with a certain amount, after the half-life period, you're going to have half of it still being radioactive. After another half-life period, you're going to have half of that still being radioactive. And eventually, it's radioactive, and this is going to be negligible. So ask with a question, what is the half-life of the radioactive substance below? And we can see it's about 400 years, 400 and then 800 and then 1200. Oh, sorry, not years, seconds. A lot of the radioactive elements that they use for medicine, um, they're very short half-lives. So they might inject you with something to help them do some diagnostic. And usually that would have a half-life of maybe a few hours or something like that. Okay, nuclear fusion. Compared to nuclear fission, nuclear fusion would have the advantage that it, oops, I never finished this question. 
Okay, but here's the idea. In fusion, you take two hydrogen atoms and you smash them together and they make helium and you get a bunch of energy. And um, so the nice thing about it is that it does not involve radioactive elements. This is what happens in the sun. The trick though is you need an extreme amount of heat to begin with to, in order to get these two to fuse together. And one of the hydrogens is, actually they're both special hydrogens. One's called deuterium and the other one's called tritium. So this is hydrogen with an extra neutron. This is hydrogen with two extra neutrons. Okay, um, so maybe someday in the future we'll have clean fusion energy.